to ask some questions tonight as we begin this study. It says that God hates this. That's pretty strong, folks. For God to hate something in Scripture, okay? So why does God hate pride or a haughty spirit? What causes a person to be proud? Are there consequences to uh, the sin of pride? And is there, is there a cure for it? We're going to talk about that tonight. And so I wanted to set the, the standard here or to set the tone here in Proverbs chapter 6. Now, what we're going to look at is the description of pride and then we're also going to look at the defeat of pride in this study tonight. In order to get to the description of pride, we need to go to Isaiah chapter 14. If you have your, uh, you've got your Bibles there, go from Proverbs to Isaiah. We use this particular passage when we started this study because we wanted to identify who our enemy was, the deceiver, and it was, it is Satan, it is Lucifer. And here in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 17, we have a description of him and what uh, uh, Lucifer did there in heaven and was uh, banished out, okay, and was kicked out. And it begins in verse 12, okay? So let me read the beginning in verse 12. It says, How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you shall thrust, you will be thrust down to Sheol to the re recesses of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you, saying, This is the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the worlds like a wilderness and overthrew its cities, who did not allow his prisoners to go home. Now, what I want you to notice there in verses 13 and 14 is how many times the word I is used. It says, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights. I will make myself. So clearly, uh, Lucifer uh, was full of himself, okay? And so clip, Scripture clearly teaches us that God hates a proud look. And so here in, uh, not only in Proverbs, but in Isaiah, you see the character of pride there in Isaiah uh, in how many times uh, I is used. He was full of pride. That was his downfall. And folks, he is using, I believe, the sin of pride to disrupt and destroy people today. I wonder tonight how many prideful people have found their way into hell because of the sin of pride. Well, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm a pretty good person. I'm better than most. And uh, I think I can handle it on my own. I don't need uh, some deity uh, to pull me out. I'll just raise myself up from my own bootstraps. And folks, that certainly uh, happens in people's lives. So the character of pride here in describing it is that pride will um, lead us uh, astray, and it will hurt us as, uh, as individuals. Now, what is its causes? We see its character, but what is its causes? Now, I want you to turn in the New Testament to Luke chapter 18. I want to I kind of park in Luke chapter 18 because we have the, the parable of the Pharisee and the publican or tax collector, and it's not the parable of the Pharisee and the Republican. Okay? I know there are some people that like to translate it that way. But we're going to see the cause of pride, and I believe this to be a very important passage. Number one, because Jesus taught it. Anytime Jesus' words uh, are there for us. We need to take serious stock. Not that other, you know, all scripture is inspired, but folks, clearly this is a teaching of Jesus and he brings this up 
And for him to bring it up, it must be uh, something that we should be concerned about. So in Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, here's what the Scripture says. And he told this parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Really hone in on verse 9. Before we even get to the parable, Jesus is explaining the reason why he's giving us this parable. He said, I'm telling you this parable to certain ones who trust in themselves and look down on others. That, he's describing pride, folks. Okay? Verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax gatherer. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself. Notice that. God, I thank thee that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax gatherer, standing some distance away, was not even willing to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you this, I tell you, this man went down to the house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Now, folks, the cause of pride in this passage begins with an elevation of self. A prideful person thinks that he or she is superior to other people. Just look at the contempt that you see in this passage. Uh, notice that Jesus, his words, it's, it's very telling where he says there in verse 10, or actually verse 11, the Pharisee was praying to himself. He wasn't making any connection to God, folks. That tells us something tonight. If we are ever going to make it in the realm of prayer, we've got to make sure that we are humble. We've got to make sure that we don't pray any prayers like this. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Folks, we've had, I, I, I can't, I don't know how many times I've had people. I've actually had people come out the back of a service and say, Boy, Brother Jim, if them sinners had been there here today, they'd have really got it. Well, folks, the last time I checked, I'm one of them. And any time I point a finger, remember there's three fingers coming back at me, okay? And uh, so the Pharisee here is full of himself. And he is exactly what Jesus said Certain ones who trust in themselves that they were righteous. This is self-righteousness. And, and listen, you've known these people. They're very difficult to live with. They're very difficult to deal with a lot of times. And listen, folks, when we ever get to the point that we look down upon people, that ought to be a red flag to our mentality, who we are as Christians. Jesus never would want us to look down on anyone, okay? That is not his, that's not his heart, and if we're going to be like Christ, it should not be a part of our heart. We see this attitude in 21st century humanistic thinking. It is a self-righteousness that leads to destruction. Uh, the, the humanistic uh, thought today is that God's out of the picture. He doesn't even exist. I've got to figure this out myself. And folks, let me tell you something. The United States will never figure out what's going on in this world. Education is not going to solve our problems. And neither is technology. And neither is some of the uh, uh, gender stuff that's going on in our country today as well. If we think in any way, shape, or form that we're going to be able to handle it ourselves, we have failed, and that is, a, that is a tremendous problem. I believe that the Pharisee not only was full of himself, I believe he also felt like that God owed him an audience because of his works. Because he, he puts them down. It's like he's checking off his scorecard here. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. He wanted God to know, hey, I'm spiritual. Take notice, God. 
Listen, whether we, you know, yes, we're supposed to be faithful in our giving. Yes, we're supposed to be faithful in our prayer life, in our devotional life. Yes, we're supposed to be faithful in our witnessing, whatever it may be. But folks, uh, we ought to be satisfied with God knowing what we're doing. We don't need anybody to tell us or to toot our horns. Uh, I, as a pastor, I don't need someone to pat me on the back and say, great sermon. Uh, I appreciate when it happens. But listen, folks, my responsibility is to the Lord ultimately. And your life and, and my life is ultimately responsible to the Lord as well. So I believe that that certainly uh, God is turned off by the legalistic uh, behavior, the desire of a heart that is humble and grateful for God's blessing and provisions. I believe that's what he desires. He wants someone who is willing to empty himself of himself and then be filled with the spirit of god god looks at the heart of a person so the question tonight are we prideful or are we humble and folks god is not neutral to pride james 4 6 he who gives a great he, he, but he gives a greater grace therefore it says god is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble you want to get on God's bad side? Be full of yourself. You want to be on God's bad side? Look down on people. But if you want to be like Christ, you've got to get rid of it. God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. All right? So that's the description of pride that is found in Scripture tonight. But I want us to see the defeat of pride tonight. And that means we've got to go to Proverbs for just a minute. So slip back over to the Old Testament and go to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 2. Now, this is something I, I hadn't really thought about until I did some study. But you know, the Old Testament tells us that the 12 tribes of Israel in the wilderness would pitch, pitch their tents around the tabernacle symbolizing that their life centered in God. Tabernacle was there in the center and then the 12 tribes would, would have their uh, accommodations around it. Um, and so I believe that that is important uh, and it, it's, it's a clear uh, picture, I believe, that symbolizes the fact that God is or should be in the center, okay? It's not about the individual, but it's the Lord. He's the center. Some of you uh, that have gone to seminary years ago, like I did, may remember uh, a book called The Concentric Circles of Concern. I believe, Oscar Thompson, I believe, he died of cancer. He was a professor there at Southwestern. But boy, it was a, a tremendous book, still have it in my library to this day. But he had those concentric circles, and God was the center. And then everything built out around that family, spouse, and the activities within the church, you know, whatever else was going on in your life. But if you put God in the center, then everything else uh, would fit and, and fit right. But if God is not in the center, then things obviously would get tough. Um, the sin of pride does the exact opposite. God is removed, self is put on the throne. And folks, when that happens, there's chaos. Now in Proverbs, we see if we're going to defeat pride, we've got to see, first of all, it's condemnation. In Proverbs chapter 6, it says... Um, or excuse me, I'm sorry, not Proverbs 6. In Proverbs 11, it talks about some consequences. Now, we talked about Proverbs 6, that God hates it. We talked about Luke chapter 18, where he, he pointed out the parable of the self-righteous Pharisee who was not justified in his prideful prayer, okay? Then the consequences of this pride, Proverbs 11:2 says this. When pride comes, then comes dishonor. 
but with the humble there is wisdom. There are really four specific consequences found in Proverbs in having a prideful heart. Number one, pride brings disgrace, and that was chapter 11, verse 2. When pride comes, then comes dishonor, okay? Another word for uh, disgrace or dishonor is the word shame, okay? The proud are going to be humiliated, humbled, okay? The Bible teaches us. Number two, pride leads to discipline. Go to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5 here for just a moment. Just a few pages over. In Proverbs 16, 5, it says, Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. The idea of abomination is something that it's detestable is behind the word abomination. And, God, and the Old Testament uses the term abomination in many different uh, terms. It uses it in reference to homosexuality. It is an abomination to the Lord, uh, the subject of homosexuality uh, and other things. But here it talks about uh, a prideful heart. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Uh, you're going to be disciplined the Bible teaches if you continue down this uh, area, this way, being, uh, being uh, prideful. All right, number three, pride leads to destruction. Proverbs 16, verse 18, just a little further down in Proverbs 16. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Okay, I kind of think of the builders and the individuals who were on the ship Titanic back in 1912. And I'm not, I don't remember, I, I was trying to check to see if it, it was uh, proved, you know, as far as uh, factually, historically, but in the movie, the recent movie Titanic, uh, one of the characters uh, says it is unsinkable. God cannot sink this ship. Never should have been said. Because, folks, um, it can be sunk, and it did. On its maiden voyage, it is no match for an iceberg, and 1,500 souls died that night. And yet there were those who were gloating and saying, why, this ship is unsinkable. It's, it's just too big. Well, folks, that's what pride does, okay? Pride leads to destruction. Then number four, pride leads to devaluation. In Proverbs 29, 23, a few uh, chapters over in Proverbs 29, 23, here's what it says. A person's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will will obtain honor. The higher uh, the opinion of oneself, the lower God will bring to that person. Uh, when it is also said and done, pride insults God. Uh, folks, we are not better than God, and we are no better than anyone else on this earth. I am who I am tonight by the grace of God. Uh, my family, you know, I... Uh, sometimes you will see that. In, in fact, if you go back to the Titanic, if you remember, the Titanic had first class, second class, third, and fourth steerage. And depending on the, uh, what you had ticket-wise, and in, again, in the movie Titanic, you had the upper crust who were up there in the top in, the, uh, in, in first class, and they got the nice meals and the champagne and all of that stuff. And uh, got to eat with the captain and all of that. But folks, when it came down to it, when that ship began to sink, that, those rich people's money couldn't do anything for them, could they? They would have loved to have been able to buy them a raft or a, a small boat or something to float. Um, but that's the way uh, things are ordered in this world. And folks, we can't help it because we're sinful people. We have a tendency to do that. 
Well, I know some people, so I can, I can make some inroads here, and I can have some special favors. Um, we are not better than anyone else. We must empty ourselves of the toxin of pride if we are ever to be pleasing to the Lord. Folks, if God hates pride, a haughty eyes, then we have got to, that's got to be removed if God's going to be pleased with us. So that, the, there's the condemnation, there's the consequences. Those are the four consequences that I wanted to share with you. But now the cure. What is the cure to pride? Well, you're going to have to go to Philippians chapter 2 real quick, okay? Philippians, the second chapter, could be one of the most important passages of Scripture that we've ever um, really looked at. I encourage you to keep looking at it because it is so important. And on the subject of pride and humility, Jesus is the supreme example. Now, I'm going to read beginning in verse 1, and then we'll come back. But pay attention to verses 5 through 8 because it talks about Christ, but then the first four verses uh, deal with what the Apostle Paul was trying to get across. All right, so here it goes. Verse 1, chapter 2, Philippians. If therefore there be any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, Maintain, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent in one purpose. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely, merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in, a, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now folks, it's clear in this passage of scripture, verse 5 through 8 speaks of Jesus emptying himself to become man, did not e regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, and humility is emptying oneself to make room for God. Jesus emptied himself, came to this earth, and then he was willing to take on flesh, humble himself to the point of being obedient that led him to the cross. Folks, that is the example that Jesus set before us. Now, in the first four verses, really specifically verses 3 and 4, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard each of you, uh, regard one another as more important than himself. Pride is the opposite of that. Pride elevates self. You are more important than anybody else. That's why the Apostle Paul here was trying to get across to the Philippian believers, listen, if we're going to make it in this world, if we're going to make it in the, in, in the church, we as the called out ones, we have got to be different than the world. Folks, if we uh, have pride and, and are full of ourselves and puffed up and think our way is better than anybody else's and all we are interested is I, me, and my Folks, that's going to create issues within a church family. But when we think of others more than ourselves, when a church looks inward instead of outward, problems develop. As long as we continue to focus on winning people for Christ, doing evangelism and doing things that reaches our community always looking out always looking to see what we can do uh, if it's nothing more than going to a um, 
an apartment complex and, and handing out uh, uh, food or, or doing some things for the children or, or whatever it may be. We've had block parties. We've done different things. We've had fall festivals. Uh, but just b looking outward, quit, don't focus inward. I think God will be blessed and we won't suffer the tendency to look at ourselves, okay, and be full of ourselves. Uh, Paul emphasizes this same mind, looking out for others' interest. Folks, that is humility. Humbling ourselves before the Lord. And what did it say? God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Listen, I don't know about you. I don't want God's opposition. I don't want to get on his bad side. I want his grace. So if I will humble myself, yield to his leading, yield to his direction in life, then folks, I believe that we can be the Christ-like examples that Christ uh, desires for us, okay? So, Jesus is the example here in this passage of Scripture. The cure for pride is to have more of Jesus, is to have more of his attitude. Each and every day, not my will, your will. Not my ways, Lord, your ways. And by the way, uh, Isaiah 55 tells us that uh, his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways, okay? So we need to constantly ask for that. I'm going to close with this. Uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse, a great preacher years ago, he told the story supposedly true about a Chief Justice, Charles Evan Hughes. When he moved to Washington, D.C. to take up his duties as Chief Justice, he transferred his membership letter to a Baptist church in the area. His father had been a Baptist minister, and he also had made a profession of faith in Christ. And it was the custom of all new members to come to the front of the sanctuary at the close of the worship service. The first to be called that morning was Ah Singh, a Chinese laundryman, had moved to the capital from the west coast. He took his place on the far left side. Uh, let me say that again. He took his place at the far side of the church. As the dozen or so other church members were, or new members were called, they put themselves on the opposite side of the church, leaving the Chinese laundryman by himself. When Chief Justice Hughes was called, instead of going with the rest of the others on this side, he went and stood by the Chinese laundryman. Um... The minister, when he had welcomed the whole group into the church fellowship, he turned to the congregation and said this, I do not want this congregation to, rem to miss this remarkable illustration of the fact that at the cross of Jesus Christ, the ground is level. Barnhouse commented, Mr. Hughes behaved like a true Christian. He took his place beside the laundryman, and by his act, he prevented embarrassment to the humble Chinese person. He showed the love of Christ by standing by his side. Now, obviously, you can do more than that, but he saw that opportunity. Humble yourself. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you at due time. Folks, there's a time coming when God will uh, exalt us, but we need to humble ourselves first. We need to remember what Christ has called us to do. So the Lord hates pride. He hates the sin of pride. It is a toxin. It will hurt you as a Christian. And folks, it can hurt a church congregation as a whole. Let us not be full of ourselves. Instead, let us humble ourselves, thinking of others more than we think of ourselves. Think of the needs of others. Again, that's, that, was our, that was our Lord. He was never thinking about himself. He was always thinking of the needs of others. And folks, that's why he made a difference. And that's why I believe you and I can win the battle over pride.
Humble yourselves before the Lord. This week, instead of you, something, somebody doing something nice for you, figure out something that you can do for someone this week and show the love of Christ. And folks, when that happens, our hearts are full because we know that we are imitating our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? All right. Let me uh, share with you some uh, prayer requests tonight before we pray. One of our church members is on disaster relief this week, Philip Burton. He's in Oklahoma City. Uh, they're doing some tree trimming and uh, helping some uh, families uh, from an uh, ice storm back, I believe it was, in December. And so he's got the opportunity. He loves doing this. So let's remember Philip tonight as he, he will be there for the rest of the week. Uh, we've got several uh, church members uh, that, uh, again, have been diagnosed with COVID, John and Sharon Bettis. Let's remember them tonight. Sonia Carper, I'm a Jean Halstead. Um, of course, Ross and Kay Mapson are recovering from it. They've had it a little bit. Um, Jimmy Roberts, Laura Shaw, uh, Jim and Vicki Talbot, and Max and Jenny Wallace for sure. Now we have, uh, there may very well be some others, but that's what we have at this point. Uh, and then, of course, there are others that are coming off of it. Uh, uh, I know the Henry family, Jeremy and Elizabeth and all of their kids had had it, but they were here at church after uh, being done. So uh, anyway, we're grateful uh, to see people who have had it at least being able to get over it, okay? Now, one of the individuals that has been coming to our church, he's not a member of our church yet, but Jerry Patterson uh, had has COVID and he had some other lung issues. He is in the hospital, so we want to remember him tonight. He's down on our uh, church family prayer list. Uh, some of the others that you see there, uh, we've been asked to remember a Sarah, Sarah Chapman, who's a friend of Vera May, who needs a cornea transplant. This Cunningham family, Wes and Cunningham and his family, they were not able to have that funeral today because of some of the family members had been uh, uh, diagnosed with COVID, so they have put that service off. So we need to remember that. His wife was only 42 years of age. Uh, she passed away with some blood clots, uh, so we need to remember that situation. Cindy Ham had the appendectomy surgery Sunday. She's home healing. Uh, praise the Lord for that. Continue to pray for Cindy. Shirley Lash, one of our church members, uh, she has great nephews. Her her great nephew's family has COVID, and they are not doing not doing well right now. So let's remember them. I, I mentioned an Emily Mitchell to you Sunday an accidental gunshot wound to the sh shoulder, had surgery and is doing okay, but certainly needs our prayers. Uh, Charlene Pritchard yesterday had a port, a new port put in. She's a little sore tonight, but she is home, and I talked with her just a little bit before uh, we uh, came in tonight. So let's remember that. Some of our others that we have been praying for on a consistent basis, uh, Alan Bruns, uh, Mark Clark, uh, Mark will be going to the Mayo Clinic on the 18th. We need to remember him. Gene Grounds with radiation treatments in Joplin. Jerry Hamm. Uh, Tina Henry, uh, she continues to undergo uh, treatment for liver cancer. Let's remember Bertha Holden tonight. She has uh, fallen recently and has been weak. Uh, Sandy Killian uh, in rehab in Broken Arrow. Debbie Moore, uh, she's out of isolation but still having some COVID symptoms. Mentioned to you, Jerry Patterson, Bob Short, I believe is in, I think he's in Lake, uh, Lake Villa, uh, Grand Lake Villa, uh, rehab, and uh, we need to remember Bob uh, tonight in our prayers. Jarrett Turney, uh, uh, still doing chemo treatments with the cancer uh, that he's been dealing with, so Let's remember that situation. I ask that you also, uh, I didn't go ahead and put her on the prayer list tonight yet, but uh, my mother, Shirley Pasley, um, she, uh, we believe she is dehydrated and also has another uh, UTI, a urinary tract infection. It really affects uh, older people when that happens. And so just remember her, if you would, tonight. 
uh, in your prayers. She is um, in Tulsa. We're gonna, we may have to get her into the hospital if she doesn't start getting better. So just ask that you remember that situation. We've been praying for Jerry Crawford, who has stage 4 colon cancer. He's the son of a former pastor here, uh, Lloyd Crawford. Judy Gardner is Steve Cecil's sister, stage 4 cancer, not doing well. I believe she's out in Clinton, Oklahoma. Uh, friends of Jess and Maxine Clark, Jerry and Lisa, having some health and memory issues. Uh, a friend of Howard and Joyce Irving, the lady's name is Patricia. Uh, let's remember her. I, I can give you just two lines down there. Roshana, uh, who had the preemie baby. Uh, Ellie, I was trying to remember her name. Ellie, she continues. I'm getting updates and seeing, getting pictures every once in a while. Uh, she has gained weight, doing better, and so we praise the Lord for that little baby. And then we've been praying for Tammy Ruhlman, who is the daughter of Grover York out in California. Uh, with lung cancer. So these and others, I haven't mentioned every one of these. We have other family members that have COVID uh, situations that people are getting over them. And so let's remember them tonight in our prayers. Uh, do you have any others that you would like to mention tonight before we uh, pray? All right. Well, I am going to close us in a word of prayer. I appreciate your faithfulness tonight. Remember one another this week. We'll be back together this coming Sunday. And uh, hopefully you can join us uh, for Bible study at 9, worship at 1030. Pray for one another. And if we can do anything uh, for you as a church family or as a church staff, uh, please don't hesitate to call us. One other prayer request, Brother Daniel, who is our family ministries pastor, will leave Saturday to go to uh, Southern Seminary to do part of his uh, doctoral work and also Chris Schilt is he also at Southern he's at Southeastern in uh, North Carolina so brother Chris and the Schilt family they're preparing to go back to Malawi at the end of the month but brother Chris is doing his doctoral studies over there at Southeastern uh, Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake For or in uh, North Carolina so let's remember both of these young men as they uh, do their studies that's uh, certainly not easy to do uh, carrying on with a family as well. So let's pray for them tonight, okay? All right, let's bow then for uh, a word of prayer and close tonight. Father, I thank you tonight for allowing us to study your word. Father, I pray that we would never get to the point that we think we've arrived spiritually, that we're pretty good old Joes, and that, Lord, that we don't really need you, that we can handle it ourselves. Father, we desperately need you each and every day. Father, we need your power, your strength. We need direction. Lord, we need discernment. Father, even right now, I, as a pastor, there's so many things going on in our country. There's a lot of stories out there. But Father, I don't want to be, as a pastor, I don't want to be someone who just constantly uh, harps on things that may not be true. And Lord, I know we live in an age, uh, we are living in the last days, I'm fully aware of that, but Lord, you have told us to live exemplary Christian lives, that we are to lift up the name of Christ. We, you've told us that when people see us, that they should see Christ in us. So, Father, would you help us today? And if we're going to do that, we're going to have to get rid of pride. And, Lord, each and every one of us deal with that in, in some way, shape, or fashion. So, Father, help us on a daily basis to crucify the sin of pride. And then, Lord, help us to humble ourselves and ask you for strength and guidance. Infill us with your Holy Spirit and then lead and direct us daily. Father, forgive us of known and unknown sin tonight. Cleanse us. Make us whole. Help us to live pure and holy lives. Not that we may glory in ourselves and 
beat our own chest, but that, Lord, we would be able to lift up and exemplify and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. May we always give you the glory for what you do. Father, again, be with our country. We've never needed you more than, than we need you tonight. Father, do a great work. Regardless of what happens, help Christians to be there, to stand in the gap, to pray, to witness, to serve you, to love you with all of our hearts. Go with us from this place tonight. For those who are seeing us online tonight, I pray, Father, that you would be with them in their homes, watch over them and keep them safe. And for these who have come out tonight, I pray your blessings upon them as well. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you and we ask it all in the precious and holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You are dismissed. God bless you.